good morning uh, to the uh, second DPA fundamentals session of the month. Today uh, we're, we have uh, speaker Charles Kim with Linux fundamentals for SQL Server DBAs. I don't know if you've seen any sessions on that, uh, but um, Charles is extremely well versed in this. He's he's more known from the Oracle side of things. Um, but uh, he's extremely well versed in Linux and um, SQL Server. Uh, but first, I'll talk about him in a second. We've got our normal things that we talk about. Um, our sponsors, Century One, um, who have a ton of great information and have a ton of great products. Go check them out. Uh, do a print screen or uh, uh, hit the camera and save some of these links um, everybody should download a copy of plan explore it's a fantastic way uh, to look at execution plans try it out you'll like it a whole lot better uh, and this is the full version of it we also have another sponsor db watch that have complete database management solutions for dbas Go to dba, dbwatch.com, check them out. They help pay for all of these sessions. And do us a favor and go to dbwatch.com, say we sent you. And the same thing for Century One. Um, I found out that uh, Shane said that uh, I had been misspelling his name ever since he'd been with uh, <laughs> DPA Fundamentals, so he actually spells it with two L's, so I highlighted that with a blue, so I kept remember I make mistakes a lot. Uh, and Glenda and Kevin are with us today. Um, hopefully I've got all their stuff spelled correctly. Um, this week, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, PASS has got a special thing. If you're going to sign up for PASS and you haven't signed up yet, do it this week. We have our contest that we always run to where you get $150 off if you use our code. I mean, every local chapter and every virtual chapter has that anyway. But on top of that, we put everybody in a pot uh, that uses our code and we draw out uh, one person uh, wins $500. And that kind of helps pay for some of your other things. This week, um, Pass has a extra uh, thing to where they're giving away a free session um, to people that sign up between Monday, September the 17th, 0000 UTC, and Friday, September 21st, 1159 UTC. And uh, they'll give away one three day pass to one of the users that sign up during that time, as well as they'll be giving away gifts during the week to people that sign up. So this is, if you've waited this long, this is the time to sign up. Let me go back and go back to our codes. If you didn't get a chance, there's our codes, the streaming or the discount code. The discount code gets you $150 off. The streaming will get you last year's uh, sessions online. So I'd probably go for the discounts at this point. Upcoming SQL Saturdays, uh, if you can't go to PASS, definitely go to one of the local SQL Saturdays close to you. Go to SQLSaturday.com and you can key in your location and find one that's close to you. Um, virtual chapters are, a, we have tons of them. They're going to start cutting back on the number of virtual chapters and, and concentrate on some chapters, but as of yet, they have something on practically every topic and every language. But here's some of the ones coming up. Uh, Women in Technology have a real good one coming up tomorrow. Uh, Kathy Kellenberger is actually one of the uh, uh, leaders of the Women in Technology chapter. Okay, performance. Let's see. Uh, this I've, I put everybody in here. Uh, this one. Let me go real fast. PowerShell. Da, da. We've got one October 2nd, and at this particular session, um, we will be giving away 
either one or two free um, pass uh, comps. Steve? Uh, yes. Steve, we yes. don't see your slides. We just see your desktop. Ooh. Mm, that's not good. Let me go back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Show. Is that better? Can you see now? Yes, yes, we see it okay. now. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thanks. Um, so, um, okay, yes, on the October second, when we've we have with our contest, we have accumulated enough to give away one free comp, and we were close to sec winning a second one. If we do, we'll be giving that away after the October second session. Uh, you need to show up for the session, um, and uh, we will um, announce right after the session because we've got to go through different things. Uh, you can't have one that you've bought already uh, to win one of those. So, Minute Technology, that's, we've got that one already. Okay. Virtual groups. Okay. Linux fundamentals for SQL Server DBAs with Charles Kim. Charles is an Oracle ACE director, VMware expert, Oracle certified DBA, certified X data implementation stat specialist, certified SharePlex administrator, and a certified, I'm not even sure what RAC expert is, but um, he's an author of 10 books, so he's well versed in this stuff. And I am going to also let you know that he wants to hold the questions to the end of the session. And go ahead and enter the questions if you want to as we're going along. But in the end of the session, we'll uh, have him ask. Uh, we'll have um, Kevin and our Glenda uh, ask the questions. And this session will be recorded. And it'll be up on our site, YouTube site, within the next couple of days. You can always get to our site at dbafund.org, or you can go through this session, or dbafundtube.org. So, Charles, I'm going to turn it over to you. I took seven minutes. That's about right. But most people didn't see my session or to see my screen, so sorry about that. Let me make you the presenter. All right. Can you see my screen now? Yes, it looks good. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules and during lunch to come listen to me talk about uh, Linux Essentials for SQL Server DBAs. Um, before I begin, uh, I wanted to go and give a little history about myself. And in particular, um, I've been in the IT space since uh, 1999, and I started my career, obviously, in, in the Oracle space. But during the uh, dot-com days, uh, I, worked, I was fortunate enough to work for a company uh, called i2 Technologies and we developed software for the supply chain management industry. And we had to port our databases from um, Oracle to SQL Server. And that's where my SQL Server journey actually started. And I've been pretty much uh, in the SQL Server space on and off since 1999. Um, but from a Linux perspective, uh, I, I've been in the Linux space for um, since like 2003, 2004, dabbled in it for a long, long time. And you'll actually see my Twitter tag is Rack DBA. And, and the part Rack stands for Real Application Clusters. And so uh, most of my career in, uh, in the past 15 years has been in the clustering technologies. And so, and when we deal with clustering, you have to know the operating system, the network, and the storage really, really well. And so, um, when I, went to, to, when I went to go work for a company called Fidelity National Financial and Fidelity Information Services, I got certified at Red Hat 
and I got certified in obviously in all the Oracle stuff. And I even got certified in SQL Server. And so I just don't uh, promote it as much as the other credentials that I have. Um, I'm also certified in VMware as well as um, you know, technologies like Shareplex. And so we are a um, platinum partner with uh, Shareplex. This is Quest Shareplex. And this year alone, uh, I've been involved and our company has been involved in doing over 27 migrations and implementations of data migration and integration between Oracle and SQL Server. And so um, I don't want to go spend too much time on what we do, but we specialize a lot in zero downtime migrations and zero downtime upgrades. And so from a uh, SharePlex perspective, we use it a lot to move data around between different operating systems and different databases. And believe it or not, you know, now, you know, SQL Server and Oracle is actually considered little data and the world of Hadoop and, um, you know, uh, big data is a whole new realm that we uh, will adventure in the next future. So a little bit about the agenda that we're gonna cover today. We're gonna go through the uh, SQL Server installation process. And the reason why this is important is because on the Linux platform, there is no GUI. And so uh, we're going to go spend some time in the installation and then a little bit of time in the configuration side. And then we're going to talk about RPMs. Um, and this is the actual um, software distribution that we're going to actually go and uh, pull from either the DVD or from, you know, um, uh, repositories that are in, in the Internet. And then we're going to talk about uh, huge pages and some of the kernel tuning that we're going to do, talk about scheduler, IO scheduler in particular, talk about uh, NTP, the network time protocols, and how do we keep our servers in sync. And then we're going to talk about networking uh, in particular with, you know, bonding network cards for, for, for aggregation and performance, uh, talk about jumbo frames and what that entails, and then talk about some firewall um, management components. And then we're going to go and talk about uh, system logging, because as we go and have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of servers, right, how do I monitor all my database servers all at once? And then we'll talk about how do we actually log into the actual server itself, uh, and then um, talk about VNC server, which is equivalent to RDP on the Windows side, and then uh, we're going to talk about NFS. And if we have time permitting, I'll go through some of these shell scripting, shell scripting tips and tricks that I've uh, learned over the years. And so another thing I'm gonna cover is what I consider to be my top 10 commands or actually set of commands um, that every uh, Linux uh, SQL Server DBA should know. We'll go through that. All right, let's start with um, what I call state of the penguin, right? So if you look at most companies out there, uh, the predominant um, Linux operating system is gonna be Red Hat. And then it's gonna be followed by um, uh, Ubuntu, and then, and then probably be SUSE at the end, right? And so if you look at um, Red Hat, right? Red Hat 7.3 and 7.4 is what, if you look at all the documentation from Microsoft, that is what SQL Server 2017 is certified against. But however, 7.5 is out, uh, came out in April this year. And, um, and the way that you find out what release that you're running at, right? Uh, there's two commands you can type, cat sc red hat dash release or uname dash a. And so people are also talking about CentOS, right? CentOS is the free distribution of Red Hat. And so um, most companies will run CentOS or some companies will run CentOS like in development platforms. But as you go live and in the production environment, right, you're going to be uh, running on Red Hat. And so um, let, let's look at the roadmap a little bit, right? So as you can tell, uh, Red Hat 7.5 was released about April timeframe, right? And you're gonna expect 7.6 next year, probably about the same timeframe. And 7.7 .7 is going to be in 2020, right? Um, for people who are on Red Hat 6, right? You, you, as you can see, right? This is the last year that the, or, uh, the Red Hat will offer releases for that. From an installation perspective, right? Oops, sorry, I should have put this in full blown mode. Uh, from an installation perspective, right? Um, I provided a URL for a simple uh, setup perspective, but um, there's three main um, supported flavors of Linux, uh, Red Hat, Ubuntu, and SUSE. And if you are going to containerize your SQL Server right, environment, um, you can actually, as long as you're running Docker 1.8, you can run SQL Server 
inside of Docker. And so for those who are not familiar with, with Docker, right, it's a containerization technology that runs native on your operating system, right? And, and the beauty of it is, is that it's not, it's not a virtualization platform. So it leverages the, the executables and the resources, right, that's native to your current um, uh, operating system. And it feeds and uses whatever else it needs to fork out the processes. And so, um, and so for example, I'm running Docker inside of, on, my, on my Mac laptop, and I am able to run SQL Server 2017, right, as a Docker image uh, con containerized on my Mac. And so, well as um, I'm, I'm also running um, some sort of virtualization like VMware, um, VMware as well as maybe Oracle's uh, version of virtualization, right? And I can run uh, SQL Server in a virtualized infrastructure as well, right? And so from an installation perspective, the steps are really relatively simple, right? Um, as, you, as you can see, going from left to right, I showed examples on how to actually go download the, the repo file, right? On Red Hat and on Ubuntu and also on SUSE, uh, SCLX version. Right, the repo file basically all it does is points to the uh, URL where we can actually download SQL Server. Okay, and so um, actually not the SQL Server, but the uh, the actual binaries associated with that. Right, and then what we're going to do is we're going to do an update, and then we're going to do an install. And um, whether you do it on Red Hat, Ubuntu, and, or SUSE, it's very similar. Right, we're going to install, and then we're going to actually go through the configuration component. Right. So let's go look at the system requirements. Um, there's two file systems that uh, SQL Server is, is supported on. One is ext4, which is the, um, the most common uh, file system out there. The second most um, file system is XFS. And so XFS was developed by a company called Silicon Graphics back in 1993. And it's really popular because it's extremely scalable and um, it has a lot of the features that um, other file systems do not support. Uh, for example, right, it, it has um, online resizing capabilities as well as online defragmentation capabilities. XFS in the roadmap, they had, um, they're saying that they'll eventually support the ability to create snapshots on the file systems, right? And so that's gonna be uh, a really big uh, feature that they're gonna have. Um, it also supports direct IO and sparse files, and uh, another, another big thing is variable block sizes. And so um, the block sizes can be anywhere between 512 bytes and all the way up to uh, 64K. The minimum disk space that we need to install SQL Server is six gigabytes. And obviously from a CPU perspective, right? Uh, we want two cores at minimum two gigahertz each uh, with, uh, on a 64-bit platform. Okay, we can also run SQL Server and place data files, database files on NFS. The NFS version must be at least 4.2 or greater or higher. To download the repo file, now, we're, now I'm gonna focus mainly on Red Hat. And the reason being is, is that, like I said before, Red Hat is the predominant Linux flavor that most companies run. We, we do see, you know, SUSE implementation as well as uh, Ubuntu implementations, but uh, still ma majority of the enterprises still run Red Hat. So we're going to actually download the repo file, and that's going to be from Microsoft's website, right? A um, lot of the things that we talk about here, uh, I have a step-by-step -step installation with screenshots available. If you want to go pull it from my website, dbaexpert.com slash blog. Once we download the repo file, right, we can actually go and issue the yum command to install SQL Server. The dash Y option basically says, don't uh, prompt the user uh, to respond with a yes or a no. And so as you can see, we have actually um, downloaded the packages from Microsoft's website, MS SQL Server, and it's running 64-bit, and it's gonna go through unpackaging and doing the install. And then once we have downloaded and installed the software, now we're gonna actually go and set up the software, right? And so what it's asking within the MS SQL configuration process is 
Are you going to install a standard edition, the enterprise edition, developer edition, etc.? Um, since this, this is on my lab, I'm going to choose the developer option, uh, which is number two, and proceed with the configuration. From an MS SQL configuration perspective, there's many other options that you can choose as well. And you can run these independently, right? Uh, obviously, there's an option to uh, configure the agent and um, change your correlation, correlation, I mean. And then also, you can change the default data directory, the, uh, the default log directory, uh, and et cetera, as you can see here, okay? And so, I provided all the options for you to reference later. And once the uh, SQL Server is configured, I, I leverage a command called systemctl, and um, with that command, I can check on the status of SQL Server, right? As you can see, there are processes running from opt MS SQL bin, and my SQL Server is running. I can actually also pass the dash L option to show a full listing of the, the actual log itself. Okay, so systemctl is going to be utilized pretty much with any kind of system admin, administrative function that we have to start or stop processes. And you can even get statuses of processes as well. So let's go look at opt MS SQL slash bin. This is where the binaries reside, right? And in here, there is a file called SQL Server, right? And if I use a command called file, which displays the type of file it is, right? I can quickly see that this is a shared object, right? This is an executable. There's also a file with a .sh extension, right? And if I use the file command again, I can see that this is a shell script in, in ASCII format. So because it's a shell script, I can go actually do a cat on it and look at the contents of the file. I can also use the strings command to look at text that is inside of a binary file. And so again, I can do a strings on SQL Server, as I can see, uh, and as you can see, you can actually see a certain process and information, threading information, socket information, stuff like that as well. And so uh, strings is very po powerful. And this is the reason why that we want to encrypt our database files, enable TDE, right? So that people who have access to the database files um, can't poke around. And so if you're a really good uh, hacker in the Unix, uh, in the Linux world, you can do things like dumps, hex dumps, convert the actual uh, data back and into a format that you can actually use. Okay, so once we installed SQL Server, right, there's two files we're looking at, uh, Etsy password and Etsy group, right? So we have created a user called MS SQL and the SQL Server runs as that user. MS SQL uh, also has a default group called MS SQL. So in this case, it's MS SQL is the user ID and also the group, right? Um, and that's how all the files in the Linux operating system is owned by, right? So, so SQL Server is running. I wanna go and do a ps-ef process list, uh, do a full listing of the actual commands and look for uh, MS SQL because I have a, a user called MS SQL, right? Because all the process is running as that user. And I'm gonna, um, the, the grep-v basically says, because um, my output is gonna have grep in it, just ignore that last line. And so, uh, as you can see, there's two processes running as SQL Server. Okay, there's another command that everybody likes, and that's the dash fu option, right? So no one's gonna forget that. It's gonna be ps dash fu, find user for a uh, full user uh, for the MS SQL. Let's look at var opt MS SQL data. This is where all your database files are gonna reside in, right? And as you can see, you, you'll have logs as well as, as database files, okay? So you are allowed to put your database files on NFS, right? And so Oracle, in, in the Oracle in this world, we have been putting um, mission critical databases on NFS for over the, over the past decade, right? And so uh, in the uh, SQL Server world, it's gonna be very interesting to see as Linux becomes more and more popular, um, how much uh, databases will get put on NFS. Okay, and so um, as part of the best practice, after the database is laid out because uh, the installation process does not allow you to 
create multiple TempDB files, right? As part of the best practice, configure uh, multiple TempDB database files. Okay, let's talk about YUM. The word YUM stands for Yellow Dog Updater Modified. Um, and I provided a link uh, as a cheat sheet. From a ease of maintenance, right, we want to use YUM to install software packages uh, for Linux. Okay, and so um, there's RPMs, right, and RPMs are what we are going to actually install. And we'll go through the RPM management as well. But the world of RPMs, we have this concept of dependencies. And so if you look at Perl, for example, right? If I wanted to install Perl on a Linux box, it's not just a simple executable that I just go download and install, okay? So if I was to go do that from an RPM perspective, Perl has many dependencies. It's got dependencies on network drivers. It's got dependencies on IO drivers. It's got dependencies on socket drivers, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so and what's gonna happen is that Perl is gonna ask you to install a network driver. And that network driver is gonna install, ask you to go install another driver. And then we run into this thing called dependency hell before we know it, right? I have to go install, you know, 60, 70 packages just to be able to install Perl, right? Um, Yum manages all the dependencies for us. And so if I wanted to go install a simple thing like Perl, it will go figure out what all the dependencies are and install them at the same time, okay? So with yum, I can go and list all the packages that's installed in the server with the list all command, right? I can do a dependency list. Let's say I wanted to install the NFS utils, so I can do NFS mounts, right? It'll tell me what the dependency list is. And then obviously the information, the info part gives me detailed information about a particular package. Let's say that there's a uh, executable that's already on the operating system. In this case is KSH, which is a corn shell. Execute uh, binary, right? I can go and figure out what RPM makes up that KSH, right? Um, and then we, can, we have multiple repositories, and I'll, I'll go through that in a little bit. Um, we have repositories that we can actually go via HTTP, or repository. We can create a repository off of our DVD that we download from Red Hat, or we can actually we can have a public internet uh, repository, right? And that's where the the, the repos that we downloaded earlier. Okay, so continuing with the yum command, I can install a package with a yum install. I'm just giving examples. VSFTPD is actually FTP. We typically don't want to install FTP. It was just purely an uh, example. I can do updates to existing packages that's out there with yum update. I can even only apply security related packages, right? With the dash dash security option. This is where it gets really popular is the yum local install. Is that if I want to download, for example, um, all the packages that I, that I need to instantiate my one environment, right? And, and because let's say I have created um, an environment for development and I wanna go replicate that to QA, for example, and I wanna be guaranteed that every version of the package that I have matches my development, right? I can do a local install. So I can do it via a DVD or I can do it via a, uh, a URL. So I can actually take the contents of the DVD, copy it to a directory, and update it once, and then from that point on, image all my servers with it, okay? I can remove packages with the yum-remove, and I can do group installs. So let's say that I wanted to go and install, you know, GUI Windows desktop, right? It, that, it's got tons of other dependencies as well, right? I could just simply do a group install and I'll get the X Windows system or the web server. Okay, so let's talk about taking a DVD that you download. And so a DVD will be, will be downloadable as an ISO image, right? I'm gonna take that ISO image, I'm gonna actually FTP it to the Linux server, whether that Linux server is virtualized or whether if it's bare metal, right? And then I'm gonna go and use the mount command, right? With a dash loop and dash T option, right? I'm gonna go and take that ISO image and I'm gonna mount it as slash MNT slash rhl.dvd, right? And so I'm gonna, at that after I mount that uh, ISO image, right? Uh, I, I can now access that, uh, the entire contents of the ISO in the slash rl.dvd directory, okay? However, uh, the newer versions of Red Hat have the concept of auto mount, right? And so if I just stick that DVD in or upload that DVD in to my server, right? It'll mount that slash media, since I'm logged in as CKIM, CKIM and slash rel 7.4 server 
dot x86 underscore 64. So if I go to that directory, I can see all the contents of that directory, of that DVD, okay? And so once I go into that directory, right, um, I will see a file called dot disk info, okay? The first line is very important, okay? You'll take that, th those numeric numbers that you see here, and you'll go to a directory called etsy yum.repos.d, right? In that directory, you'll create a file. You can name it whatever you want, as long as it has the, the extension .repo. And this, I'm gonna create a file called viscosity.repo, right? I took the, uh, the, the numbers that, that showed up in that file, um, created it uh, uh, on the tag of media aid, right? And then everything else, um, you can do whatever, uh, apply the details like you see here, right? Uh, the base URL is gonna be file slash slash, but because it is a um, slash run media, right? There's triple slashes there. I'm in double quoting the entire thing because I have spaces in there between 7.4 and server, there's a space, right? So I'm double quoting the entire file syntax, right? I enable it, right? And I save out of it. And I just simply go and do a yum repo list and voila, you see the viscosity, uh, the, the ISO image that I downloaded is now part of the yum repository now, okay? And so now, since um, um, I have that repository registered, right? Uh, I can go and install any software that I, that I want, okay? And so I'm gonna also download using curl, right? Uh, curl is, if I haven't mentioned it before, it's a client URL, client URL library. It allows us to connect and communicate with different protocols and also allows us to go and download internet files as well. And so I'm using curl and I'm downloading the production repository for Microsoft's website, right? And then now I am going to install MS SQL tools, okay? And the reason why I had to show you uh, the process of mounting the ISO image and creating a repository is because I, I actually need to install the Unix ODBC develop.rpm software, okay? And so I'm gonna actually go and install MS SQL tools, but at, with the same command, I'm going to also install Unix ODBC. And so MS SQL tools has a dependency on Unix ODBC. And if you try to go and download and install it, it'll fail in the middle of it. So I'm doing both at the same time. Okay. And so now I've successfully installed uh, SQL Server and I've also successfully installed SQL Server tools. Okay. So now let's go look at um, how we're going to actually connect to SQL Server, right? Uh, I'm going to use SQL command. But before I do that, I need to go source and set up my environment on Unix. I say Unix, I mean, I mean, whenever I say Unix, please take it in the context of this webinar as, as Linux, right? And so I'm gonna actually set my path and my path needs to have the opt MS SQL tools slash bin, since that's where our binaries live, right? Uh, and then I'm gonna go add that to dot bash uh, RC or dot bash profile. Most people will add it to dot bash profile, right? And we're gonna actually source that file, right? Sourcing does not mean we're gonna actually run it. Sourcing means we're gonna actually go adopt all the environment from it, okay? And so I'm going to um, set my path uh, appropriately, right? And now I can actually run uh, the SQL CMD command, right? I say dash localhost, it can be IP or host name, right? Dash U and the password and uh, once I log in, I can say select at at version, and you can see based on the output that I am running Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7.4, right? I'm also running SQL Server 2017 RTM CU uh, update four. Okay, now let's talk about enabling SQL Server agent. If you are at uh, running CU four or above, we simply enable the agent. If we're running CU3 or below, we have to actually go through the process of installing the agent, right? And so uh, since we're running uh, CU4, right, I simply run MS SQL conf to set the SQL agent, enable the true, and boom, my SQL server is, agent is now running. And I can, oops, and I can run systemctl again and restart or even get status as you see here, right? As you see that uh, it's been able uh, 12 seconds ago. Okay, so, so far we've gone through installing SQL Server, 
uh, going through the process of um, configuring a local repository, downloading repo commands using curl, um, and now we have configured our agent and started our agent as well, okay? Let's talk about RPM, right? This is what we're talking about earlier. Each RPM that, that you download, uh, that, that we have, right? It's gonna have name, dash version, release, and architecture.rpm, right? So let's take the Unix ODBC driver that we, that we installed earlier, right? Um, obviously, it's, this is version 2.2, right? Uh, release 11, and it's going 11, 2.2-11 uh, version 7.1 uh, is going to be the release. And as you can see, architecture, right? This is going to be for the 386 platform, right? Um, you'll also see no arc. That, ba that basically means that um, uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter if I'm running 32-bit or 64-bit, right? And so if, it, if, if this file for Unix ODBC was a 64-bit RPM, it will actually say x86 underscore 64, okay? I can go look at RPMs, and I can actually interrogate the RPMs and get detailed information with a dash QIP option. Um, we want, if we wanted to list the contents of the RPM, we can leverage the dash QLP option to look at what the files uh, it's gonna compose down to. If I want to install it, an RPM, I use the dash IHV. I stands for install, hash is what H stands for, and V stands for verbose, right? So H is gonna print 50 hash marks uh, as the RPM is being unpacked, right? I use a dash U for updating and um, I use the QF like, like we did earlier, right? I can go based on the uh, actual Perl executable in this case, I can use the dash QF option to figure out what RPM uh, made that Perl object uh, executable. And I can do queries um, or query all, right? Against the given RPM. If I just say RPM dash QA, that will list without any filters, it will actually list every RPM on the server. Okay, so let's take a little tour and let's talk about the top 10 commands that we as SQL Server DBA should know in the Linux platform, okay? First thing is find. Find is a very powerful command, right? Um, we can go find files based on name of the file, type of the file, right? And once we find it, we can tell it to go remove it. We can actually have it sort on numerous options, right? We can tell it to go delete it, we can go find directories, et cetera, et cetera, right? So let me go through uh, this particular set of options, right? So the first thing is we're gonna go find, um, based on the type, right? Uh, the, the, oops, the dash F means that this type of file, uh, anything that's been modified for, uh, for 14 days, right? I'm gonna go in and remove those files, okay? And we do have to say rm dash F uh, curly, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, space, backslash, semicolon, okay? That's the syntax that you just have to learn. That's just the way we will do um, as it, as we pass the output of find to the exec command, right? We, we have to go filter it through the curly brackets, okay? So now let's look at another command. Let's look at the top five largest files, right? We're, we're gonna say find dot, right? And we're going to actually go and do an ls um, long listing, and we're going to say sort based on uh, nrk, right? N is obviously uh, numeric sort, reverse order, and give me the last key based on the seventh column, okay? And I'm going to take once I do that, I'm going to do a head, which means give me the top five lines of this thing, right? And I can find the, the top largest files. I can say find larger files that are greater than 100, 100 megs, right? Dot size of 100,000 K, right? I can go delete files that are of the, of the extension dot AUD, right? Anything that hasn't been modified in 30 days, delete it, right? Um, there's numerous things we can do. I can use it based on ID or even group, as you see in the next example, okay? Number two is locating uh, a large file, right? So I, I use the find command, but there's other options to find large commands as well. Right, so I can use the ls command, right? Do an al and s, and and again look at the top five um, output of it, and um, and I know that those are my top largest files in the current directory, right? And I can look at top space consuming directories using du, right? Uh, disk usage, and I can sort 
on on size and megabytes and you know and do a top five as well okay and i could even go and pass the output to um to xargs right and awk and look at the first argument and i can go do a summarization of all the files and figure out what the size of all my database files are and it, or what the size of all my log files are right there's numerous ways we can go through uh, those kinds of um, uh, equations in a simple one-liner script right and i could find all directories all files and directories that are created in 300 megs by using awk right looking at the fifth column looking at anything that's over 300 megs and print the entire line and sort it okay there's numerous things we can do uh, tar is a very popular one too. We use tar to go just like you would do for zip, except tar is not um, compressed by default. Um, but in this example, what we're doing is we take we're, we're changing our directory to this particular one, and, and unfortunately, it's you know, and this these examples are Oracle because it just makes more sense with Oracle than it does at this point uh, with SQL Server. Uh, is I'm taking the entire binaries from Oracle's um, distribution and I'm uh, creating the tar verbose and uh, and I'm taking the standard output right and of all the files in that directory including subdirectories right I'm piping it right and I'm changing the directory to another directory and I'm actually untarring it X mean meaning uh, extract verbose right and then um, and then actually another example is I can actually tar a directory, pipe it to SSH in this example, right? Uh, to the remote host, CD to a target directory and extract, right? Verbose and the actual file to standard out, okay? Um, last one is um, you can actually do a Z for compression, right? I can actually, sorry about that. I can actually go compress uh, a given directory, right? And then pipe it out as well. So we talked about tar to actually move files over. SCP command is very popular too, right? So it can actually take a file from one server. In this case, this is a pool, right? I'm going to SCP to um, reverse, I mean, recursive, I mean, recursive, preserve all the permissions for the files and directories, right? I'm going to SCP from the server to this actual directory. And I'm going to actually go copy all of that to my current directory right where I sit right now. Okay, and if I wanted to do this in the form of a push, right, I can do SCP and I can go and take the directory that I'm in or the directory I want to go push to, and I can go copy it to the remote server as well. Okay, it always has to be username at hostname at colon um, actual directory. Okay, number five, I'm going to try to go as fast as I can now. Uh, we have this concept of rotating logs, right, and so I can actually go and um, Rotate logs on a weekly basis, daily basis, monthly basis, yearly basis, right? I can copy it. Copy truncate basically will tell me that uh, I'm going to copy and then truncate my old one, right? Uh, when I say rotate four, it's going to keep four uh, truncated copies, right? Uh, and then if I say compress, right, it's going to also compress those files as well, right? And then once I'm done every week in this case, right, I'm going to actually mail the results to Charles. There's numerous use cases for this, as you, you can probably imagine. Okay, top. We use top to look at the top processes of a given server, right? And we can use, we can actually color code um, our output as well, but um, there's numerous things uh, we can sort by, but the most important one is that I wanna list the um, output by threads, and I also want the full syntax. So here's an example of what top looks like, right? As you can see, um, I, I hit the, um, one option and the C option, right? One told me to give me all the threads, right? CPUs one, CPU, CPU zero, CPU one. This is my virtualized infrastructure allocated uh, one core, right? And as you can see, one core translated to uh, two threads. Um, and also um, by me typing the C command, right? I can see the full output to my directory structures of my command. Freeze another one, uh, tells us amount of uh, free space used and unused, right? Um, the key thing is, is that with a free command, we have, it's, it's often misleading because we have a total, in this case, 
Let's, let's look at the bottom, right? So we have in this case approximately, uh, whoops, keep on hitting click, uh, uh, 3.9, actually this is free, not, not M, uh, almost four gigs, right? Use, it says 3.5 gigs, but what we have free of uh, 350 megs, right? So you're gonna initially think that, oh my gosh, I only got 350 megs available. However, if you look at cache, right? The file system actually caches memory and it will release it as it's needed, right? So a lot of people think that, uh, you know, by looking at free and looking at the output of 348, that there's something to worry about in this case, right? Uh, when you run out of free memory, as well as your swap memory, guess what happens to your server, right? It goes into panic and it's gonna uh, most likely uh, go into one of two things, right? You can, we can set up um, protocols where instead of rebooting, it'll start go killing sessions or otherwise it'll just panic and reboot. Number eight, VMstat, uh, reports information about processes, memory, uh, paging, IO, CPU activity, whatnot. We use VMstat ex extensively. Um, and what I do is I look at CPUization, I look at the RMB columns, which is the, the first uh, two columns on the left, what's running, what's being blocked. Um, and those are very uh, good indications of, do I have too many processes running at the same time, right? And also I look at memory pages in, pages out for my VM stat. Uptime is another uh, tool, a lot, lot of system admins and um, DBAs like to see, is, it, is that not only does it show your current time, it shows you the number of users, but more so the load average in the past one, five, and 15 minutes ago. And uh, I categorized number 10, and I just put other things that you guys might be interested in. NMON is very popular in the very bottom, right, for Nigel's monitor. Uh, a lot of people use NMON for um, just to look at everything from about the system. Uh oh Oops, my uh, PowerPoint just died. Let me see if I can go back in there. Um, apologize for that. Okay, let me go back. Wow, that was surprising. Um, right, so uh, Mmon is one of the one of the more popular utilities out there. You can use like TCP dump to analyze network packets. IOSTAT is another popular uh, tool, um, a command that you can use to look at, um, you know, uh, IO weight events. Um, and LSOF is really popular to look at all the open files. So as you saw earlier, you know, the whole installation process, configuration, installation of MS tools, enabling the agent, testing the uh, connectivity and backing up the database, right? It, um, it's different for different flavors of Unix. And if you're very new to Linux, it can be a little bit of a challenge. And so what we did was um, we can actually provide a, a GUI um, UI so they can actually go through the process via click, click, click. And so eventually my, Microsoft will, you know, ad adapt um, um, a GUI front end for it. Uh, and in the interim, we're providing this capability to our customers. All right, so we have, Install SQL Server. Now I want to go log into my SQL Server. How do I do that, right? And so um, the best way to log into a, a Linux server is via SSH, right? There's tools out there called Putty. If you're on a, a Mac or Linux, Terminal is native to it, so you can just go and SSH directly to that, right? Or you can download SigWin or other tools like uh, WSL or Win32. Okay. And so now I logged in. I want a friendly prompt because uh, you you only get a dollar sign, and so if I wanted to, for for example, for my uh, prompt change, right, uh, as as I go to different directories, right, as as you can see, I went to CD uh, from CD opt in SQL, right. If I say CD bin, my prompt changes. And this is how we do it. Okay. Um, with the system CTL that I mentioned before, right, I can enable or disable as well as start and stop, right, and I can restart SQL Server with system CTL. I'm gonna go a little faster here. This is another uh, example of me stopping SQL Server, looking at the status, you can see it's dead, right? And then I can actually go and start it later on, okay? So we talked about, you know, with SQL Server, we might have hundreds of servers, right? So how do you go and instead of 
logging into each server, right? Send all the log files, all the, all the events to a centralized location, right? And there's a RPM called rsyslog, right? And we, um, all the error messages for a given server, right? Go into a file called var log messages, right? And I can go and push that out to a, de a dedicated server, syslog.viscosity.na.com, for example, right? And then I can go restart the syslog service. But however, uh, we do require, um, uh, it, not we, it requires port 514 to be open. Okay. Firewall uh, is another big one as well. And, uh, you know, we talk about um, running uh, SQL Server in security enhanced mode, right? And so um, at the same time, we only want to open ports that are relevant for SQL Server, right? So in this example, right, we want to open up port 1433. And how do I do that, right? So we use the firewall command to do it. I also want to make sure that port 22 is available as well. So you can go and look at these examples to remove, for example, ports and to add them. And obviously with every change you do, you're going to have to go and restart the firewall daemon. Okay. Uh, we looked at a couple of these earlier a little bit, but you can, you can see that the default directories for backups, data, um, the dump and logs, right? We can change all of this with the MS SQL conf. So navigating through the SQL Server directories, right? We have, you know, options for dollar home. So if you're logged in as MS SQL, right? If you say CD dollar home, right? You'll, you can, you'll actually go to the home directory. CD tilde does the exact same thing, right? If I say CD dash, that takes me to my last known directory. If I say CD MS SQL, it takes me to the uh, home directory for the MS SQL user. CD dot dot moves on one directory up. CD dot dot slash dot dot moves me two directories up, right? And uh, I can actually go and create environment variables so that I can say CD dollar logger, right? So it'll take me to the bar opt MS SQL log. So if you're looking at from a Windows perspective, here's a uh, one of the cheat sheets that we have to say, you know, this is how it translates in the uh, Linux world, right? And so, um, you know, uh, CD backslash translate to slash, which is the root file system, and CD backslash windows, where all your binaries are, is gonna be where slash bin, slash s bin. Your users, C colon users, username, will, will uh, correlate to slash home, slash username. System logs will go to var log, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? IP config um, will give you everything about the network. Oh my gosh, I apologize. I don't know what's going on. It's never crashed on me before. Okay, let me do this. Instead of using my mouse, I'm gonna use my uh, keyboard instead. And so um, we have this concept of a VNC server that's gonna be similar to your remote desktop, right? And I can change the dimensions of my VNC server. In this case, it's gonna be geometry 1280. Uh, I, can, I can actually go kill a previous session. Um, but the cool thing about on the Linux platform, just like you have in the remote desktop, is that uh, you want to be able to log back in to your previous session, right? And with VNC Server, you can do it. It's not considered to be um, secure. So a lot of your system admins and your and your foot security guys will actually fight against it. And so instead, um, a better one is Screen, S-C-R-E-E-N. And so uh, Screen is another RPM you simply download and install on, on your server. And the cool thing about Screen is that I can actually attach myself to a session. And even if I get kicked out, I can go reattach myself to that session. So a lot, lot of admins like to go and work on a screen session, and when they're ready to go home, they simply detach, and when they go back home, they simply reattach. And in the middle, if, if your connection gets lost, guess what? You can actually reattach back in, All right? All right, so cron. This, this is um, the scheduler that we have on the uh, Linux platform. So uh, cron-l tells me all my uh, cron uh, sessions for the given user. Uh, I can back up my schedule. I can load a schedule. 
uh, by using the cron tab command. Um, I could blank out a, uh, my scheduler, right? And I'm just giving, I just gave you an example of how to actually go and run, for example, this space monitoring, how to look at st stats weekly and daily and stuff like that. So just for you, to, uh, for you to look at as well. Let's talk about transparent huge pages. And this is one of the more advanced topics that we'll, we'll cover. And so um, we typically, from a kernel page perspective, right? We're looking at 4K block sizes for the Linux kernel. A default huge page, which is different than a transparent huge page, is uh, two megs in size, right? So we can actually fit approximately 500 um, kernel pages in a single huge page, right? However, when it came to huge pages, right, um, it took a lot of not a lot of not not a lot, but it, it took some maintenance to be able to go and um, configure. And, but it also takes um, requires that the server to be rebooted. And so what we do is for the actual memory that we allocate for the database, right? We'll actually go configure the amount of huge pages that we need in two meg modules, granules, as we'll call it, and then we'll actually set up our huge pages and reboot the box. Right? This caused uh, um, some issues, especially as you increase the number of uh, amount of memory that you need. Right? Um, the fact that you have to reboot the box, and so with Red Hat Six, they, in they introduce this concept of a transparent huge page. Right? The beauty of transparent huge page is that it will dynamically allocate uh, huge pages or large pages, right, as, as needed, right? However, uh, the, the, the problem that we ran into is that all the um, heavy workload database, serve, uh, database engines, right, ran into a lot of issues with transparent huge pages. And so if you look at not just Oracle, but look at Mongo, look at Couch, DB, look at all these other databases out there and look at their best practices, right? They all disable transparent huge pages. And so I'm suspecting in the future that Microsoft, as more, they get more adoption into Linux and more customers are running um, mission critical workloads uh, of, of SQL Server uh, into Linux that they will eventually um, disable huge pages as best as part of their best practice. However, um, today, best practices for SQL Server is to not disable transparent huge pages, okay? And so I'm just showing you here in, the, in this example, how do you actually go modify it to uh, enable huge pages or disable huge pages later, okay? And so in Red Hat 7, the steps are different. I provided an example on the top, but to be able to modify, we um, we have to actually go through two processes. We have to go modify a file called etsy default grub, and it um, uh, will modify the entries, right? And then we will run uh, grub to make config to go create a new grub uh, a new grub config file. Okay, um, and if we want to do it uh, dynam dynamically. To enable huge pages, we can go and modify the slash sys file systems, right, and enable it or disable it that way. Okay. To, uh, another way we can do this to survive a reboot, right, is to go enter uh, those lines from a from a sys kernel mm transparent huge pages enabled or disabled, right. We could put in the etcrc local file. So every time it runs, etcrc local file is one of, is one of the last uh, scripts that it runs, right? And then to proceed without a reboot, we can always do it dynamically as well. Okay, so there's uh, I provided a couple of URLs. The most important one is the one in the bottom, right? Is to uh, monitor your your transparent huge pages uh, usage, okay? And to be able to make the the de determination on your own. Uh, I apologize. My laptop, for some reason, is just dying here. 
um, So let's continue on here. Um, sorry that it's a little died here. Uh, let's talk about IO scheduler. Um, from a scheduler perspective, right? We have, um, and schedulers can uh, mo uh, dictate from an IO perspective, right? The best path to the, Okay, let's go here. Sorry about that again. It's crazy. And believe it or not, until today, I've never had PowerPoint crash on me. So let's go back. Let's talk about networking, right? Network bonding. And so we can actually take two cards, improve the performance of, uh, of the network, and provide HA capabilities, as well as um, throughput, uh, throughput capabilities. Um, the most popular network bonding uh, is the round robin where we can take two network interfaces and traffic will uh, bounce off each uh, network interface. Uh, the more popular one that a lot of companies use is active backup where they actually have two network cards. They bond it together. However, the second network interface never uh, wakes up until the primary dies, right? And another one that's uh, popular is uh, adaptive load balancing. And so um, this is where you actually will get the best of both worlds, where you get fault tolerance and low balancing as well. And so um, a lot of the companies will take, like I said before, right, uh, will tr choose either round robin and or um, take two network interfaces and use it in active passive mode or um, use adaptive load balancing across the two. Okay, and the way that we actually configure that is uh, with by modifying the actual network interface card, um, the network interface file in etsy sysconfig network scripts, and there's a file that's called ifcfg-eth0, or in this case, my actual interface is called ens33, right? And I can go in, and there's a um, a directive called uh, bonding op. Oh my gosh. And and I can go manipulate that file. And so I'm going to actually um, turn it over for questions since I seem to be having enormous problems with my uh, PowerPoint here. And again, I apologize for the uh, issues that we're running into. Well, thanks, Charles. Thankfully, there's only one question today. Um, it is when free dash m and top don't match the free memory number, what is the actual free memory on the, on the server? Yeah, and so top is not really reliable to get your free memory information because you have to actually take into consideration there's resident memory available, RSS memory. And so what we have to do is free is the more accurate number. And you have to go look at the uh, like I said before, the, the cache memory that the file systems are using. And take that into consideration when you, when you look at top, and when you look at the free memory available in the system. Cool. I think I answered the question. Awesome. Thank you so much again, um, Charles. It was an awesome presentation. I know I, I picked up several different things. We don't have anything Linux here, but it's always great to pick it up. Um, make sure you guys are all looking at um, our, our websites for more information, uh, dbafund.org for any content information or upcoming meetings. Also, dbafundtube.org for all the YouTube recordings, and you will see this in the next few days or so.
Um, we do have a, another question that came in, so I will be forwarding the questions to Charles afterwards. Um, if you're okay with me passing your email address to him, please indicate in the um, in the questions as well, because I can't pass it to him unless uh, unless you get permission. Also, make sure you guys are looking at our um, streaming codes, our, our discount codes. Sorry for the past summit. Um, one code lets you into um, or uh, gets you streaming access to the past Summit 2017 sessions, and the other code gets you $150 off the full price. It does go up next week, so um, that will be something that you want to go ahead and jump on if you're going to do it. Um, also, for everyone that uses our codes, uh, everybody's put into a drawing in September, and one lucky person also gets a $500 Amazon gift card. And all of that, again, uh, is on our emails. If you don't get those, make sure you check out our contact information on the website, dbafund.org. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks again, Charles. There's uh, something about there's something about these sessions that just uh, just cause things that have never failed on your laptops to fail. So you know, I, I I've never had a PowerPoint fail on me before. Not not like this. It's crazy. Luckily, it's just PowerPoint. It's not like a demo that you know crashed or what have you. <laughs> well, I, I had about a, a you know maybe about ten slides left, but. I was like, wow, this is crazy. <laughs> and uh, I, I apologize. I don't know what, what, what the deal is. That's okay. Uh, we we normally, it, if we have issues, we've, we've had some really humdinger of an issues. I mean, it just happens. Uh, the go to where would our service is pretty good, but uh, it does have some issues at times. I, I wonder if this is a... Um, the go to webinar integration with because I, I normally don't use go to webinar um, it definitely could be because uh, it puts a, a heavy load on your um, um, on your um, your drivers uh, associated with your uh, workstations and monitors um, that's one of the things when we had some issues one time they said be sure you've got all your Windows drivers up to date um, and uh, it it can't actually cause issues. It's a little just, extra load on the server, even though it's not all the people in there. But it it does put a load on the server that's doing the presentation on the workstation. It actually says it's still being recorded. Is that is that being is that true? Yeah, I'll I'll cut that off. I'll cut this okay. stuff off. But anyway. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it's one of those. Maybe we can go and add those. Because one of the things that we do is we actually pre-record a lot of our sessions. Maybe we, I can do that for you, the last, you know, 10 slides or whatever. Um, well, let's see. Um, you could in, include your slides if you want to, and we'll put th post those up. Um, I'm not sure if I could splice the two together. Mm. I'm not really that good with it. Um, YouTube software is pretty good about editing, but I don't know if I've ever seen splicing two together, so that might be difficult. Oh, that's what you're getting at. So, you, um, what 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 we do is we um um. You can always do this if you want to. 